Hello, thank you for joining us here at North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another really packed episode uh, for your exclusive viewing pleasure. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went to the Experimental Aircraft Association Air Show in Oshkosh. It's the biggest air show around. I think it's the, probably the biggest in the world or like the second biggest in the world. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate, very, very fortunate that I have a great girlfriend, seriously. Uh, we both were born on July 28th, and she knows how much I'm into aviation and space, and for my birthday, she wanted to make this happen, and so she sent me to Oshkosh. Now, I can't just let a good thing keep it all to myself in this case, Oshkosh that is. Um, so what we've done is I brought out the video camera, and you've got to see this. We got a lot of great stuff from Oshkosh 2017 right here for you. So a friend of mine, Frank Gray, came over at 6 o'clock in the morning, picked me up, and drove me over to Oshkosh. Hey, he's been there like eight or nine times. Uh, yeah, eight or nine times. This is my first. And Frank was gracious. He knew the, the layout of the land. He knew how to get there, everything. It, it was just great tra traveling companion. And we got there around noon, and here is what we saw. in this area here. See the green building there? Yeah. And we are, now we are way right about here. Now I'll turn around to the bigger one so you can really zoom in. <laughs> there we go.
they can provide an air show. the couple as chairman and Stein go to your left. They are going to give you a gift in the sky today. All of our friends, spectators, and
And so right after that, we are actually going to go right into the next thing. We had a lot of great, a uh, lot of great displays, a lot of great things going on, a lot of, lot of exhibits and uh, exhibitions and you name it. But I'll tell you one other thing that they have that's really important. Aircraft for historic preservation. There is one in particular that we have to show you about. That's all, brother. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Greenham Common today, an industrial estate in parts, other areas, ramblers, dog walkers roam. I wonder if they reflect on what happened here. The C-47, that's all brother, once parked here waiting to board young men of the 101st who would fly then parachute in darkness into enemy territory. But we mustn't forget them. We have to remember what they achieved for us all. It was to them that we owe the freedom that we in this country and America has enjoyed. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. You know, what, what if it hadn't survived D-Day and all the other missions it flew after the war? This, this airplane doesn't just fly the, the missions on June 5th and 6th. It will also go on to participate in every major Allied airborne operation that's conducted in Europe. It flies in Market Garden as well. Any one of these missions is a, is a chance that that airplane is lost forever. Late on June the 5th, 1944, That's All Brother, an American C-47 transport aircraft, took off from England. It flew into history as the first to drop Allied troops into occupied France. Believed lost, perhaps disposed of in theatre, a fate that befell so many combat-damaged aircraft, That's All Brother's final disposition has become something of a mystery. I distinctly remember a few weeks after joining the CAF, I read a blog article from Whitman Regional Airport, and it caught my attention because it was where I used to live and work in, in Oshkosh. And it was a not a very well-read blog, but it seemed to be saying that the airplane that led the D-Day invasion was sitting in the boneyard at Basler. He kind of brought it to me with the, can this really be true? It seemed quite unbelievable. In reading the materials that were assembled, there was a number of sort of factual inaccuracies that sort of made it believable that the whole story was in fact false. It seemed totally beyond comprehension that in a country as patriotic as the United States, that the airplane that led the D-Day invasion, this incredibly important artifact, would be in a scrapyard. There's just no way that that can be true. San Marcos, Texas, just south of Austin when it's finished. Okay. And right now we seem to be on schedule to fly it this fall. We're looking at late September or October. We'll be doing flight tests here at Oshkosh. How long have you guys spent on this so far? Uh, about four years it's been worked on. And it was on this airfield for 10 years before that. Here in Oshkosh? Yes. Bassler Turbo Conversions bought it something like 15 years ago uh, from New Mexico or Arizona. It was flown up here. Their intention was, they had no idea what they had. Their intention was just to convert it to a cargo plane with turb turbine engines on it and sell it. Wow. And it got pushed out in their boneyard, which you can see on the other end of the field and forgot. They just didn't get to it. So how did you guys discover it? 
an Air Force Academy cadet about four to five years ago was doing a homework assignment on what happened to a bunch of planes at D-Day. And he started tracking them down serial number wise through the FAA registries. And this one was registers as having been sold to Bassler. So he called them up one day and says, have you got this serial number? And read one off and they pulled up on the computer and said, yeah, it looks like we do. And he said, would you go out and check? <laughs> And uh, they went out and checked and said, yeah, that's it. And then he explained what they had. And the CAF heard about it pretty quick. There were several other museums and organizations that wanted it too, but our mission is to fly them, repair them and fly them and show them off, keep the history alive. And Bassler kind of got behind that and we ended up with a plane. Okay. So once we get it to uh, get it flown and down to San Marcos, L3 Communications in Waco is going to paint it for us next year. Now they paint Air Force One and they do most of the military planes, a lot of them if not most of them. Uh, they'll look for an opening in their schedule and they'll paint it back in the original olive drab green and all. The invasion stripes were put on just before the invasion and it was secret what the markings were going to be. And so when it when they got the word out, they came out with buckets of paint and mops. And we're actually going to put the markings back on it with mops just like they did, the invasion stripes. It's 3X, and it was plain W. I don't know why I'm even having it. None of that's on here now, but yeah, I've seen all the different markings and trying to learn about those. And they, they have one over at Bassler I was looking at this morning that was Tango 9, and, and I, was, I was looking at all that. Uh, yeah, we're gonna, it's going to be marked up just the same. We've even got a little Scotty in there. The co-pilot on the first mission on D-Day took a Scotty, a little dog, as you can see on the side of the plane here. That's the crew when they just returned from the mission, and the co-pilot is in the center with the dog in his arm. And they put a flag jacket down on the floor and made a little bed for him and carried him that way so he wouldn't be injured if something came up through the bottom. And we've actually got the little Scotty in the bed up there. We're going to that detail. We will be jumping paratroop, reenactor paratroopers out of it. So we're setting up the static line and uh, the jump seats will be put in it soon. What has the reception been so far here at Oshkosh of seeing this aircraft? Oh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, the aviation world gets what this plane represents. Uh, people that we deal with on the street, uh, we go out and try and find donors because this is a very expensive restoration. We have to explain the history to them and just what this plane did and what it represents. Aviation people, you can just start talking to them and, and they get it. And the response has been overwhelming uh, here, at, here at Oshkosh. How much has been invested financially so far into this restoration? Roughly $2 million at this point, which would be ridiculous to put into a plane, any other plane. <laughs> Let me say it that way. But this one, we can't put a price on. We, we honestly can't do it. How much more finances do you guys need? Uh, we're about 350,000 short between that and 500,000, I think. And so we're we're here. Look, we just unloaded the donation bomb, and we're begging everywhere we can. Uh, but that's the kind of money that we need to finish this thing up. It's going to be museum quality, as close to as it was the morning they left for D-Day. Uh, I could go into the avionics panel. That's a little different, but. Uh, the instrument panel is going to look exactly like it did on the ground, but we're going to be able to pull the autopilot panel out and got all new Garmin avionics and everything installed. So it'll be the safest, most modern from a communications and navigation standpoint, but still on the ground. A person walking in will see a 1944 plane ready to go head for D-Day. Is there a website or any way that anybody wants to reach you for more information? Yes, the uh, commemorative Air Force. Uh, you can just Google that. Go to their website. There's quite a bit of information there. And then our unit is centraltexaswing.org and we've got quite a bit of information. It'll be the home base when the thing is finally uh, finished. That's all, brother. <laughs> and it was really a delight to see that. Quick story. I was actually looking into C-47 history seven years ago, 2010. I was looking for the 440th Troop Carrier Group. I actually noticed that plane in the Basler Yards. 
I wasn't looking at the totality of D-Day. I actually knew about that aircraft there before uh, the Air Force Academy uh, student uh, or cadet did. Uh, again, if I was looking at all of D-Day, I would have actually known about that seven years ago. I, it was just a connection I actually made this morning when I was uh, putting that together. So, I mean, it was just really great to see the work that they're doing there. My hat's off to Ray Clausen. Uh, thank you for a great interview. But in the interest of time, <laughs> Uh, it's Oshkosh, uh, Warbirds. You can't. Th this is just this, this. This one blew my mind. I'll tell you after the clip. It was a surprise attack. All right, now lining up on the run. Are the fighters of World War II? Some were designed, but never won in combat. The first one in the line there, that blue one, you remember the TV series Black Sheep Squadron and Baba Black Sheep. Same name, same series, two different names. Robert Conrad starred as Great Happy Boynton, one of the highest scoring aces of World War II, using the chance bought Corsair, which in 19 flying in level flight, set a speed record of 405 miles an hour. Perhaps the most recognizable sound and profile of World War II. One of the most identifiable, the North American P-51 Mustang. The rain, while it was minimal, in its effectiveness of dropping 96 bombs. Formation of B-25s at Oshkosh. I'm sorry, B-29. I, I am excited. I am excited. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just don't see this each and every day with Oshkosh. And if I get my numbers and letters mixed up, please forgive me. I am fired up about this. And there is no script. I want you to know that. There can't be.
Ladies and gentlemen, please relax. Now, look to your right, and you get ready. could not have been possible without the 8 million women that went into the factories that made it all possible. Direct your cameras to our announcer stand, if you will, as a young reenactor by the name of Allison Beatty is depicting Rosie the Riveter. Give them a profile there, Allison, if you will. They made these machines. They made the bullets. They made the ships. They made everything there was. There were 8 million of them. They did it right. We salute the Rosies. Without them, it would not have been a shorter war as it was. History is being made in Oshkosh, as it does each and every year. Same guy signed Bill. Christmas Day, Fresno War Camp, 1943. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the integrity the great, the great people we call the greatest generation. We are here today to enjoy the freedoms tradition that we have, the military that we have, because of them and others. Today's theme is the EAA salutes the veterans. If you're able, would you join us in standing as we will observe a moment of silence and never forget what those individuals, civilian or military, did for us. Thirty-eight years ago on that very day, July 28, 1979, I attended my very first air show. I got a chance to walk inside Fifi when I was eight years old. Fifi was the first out of the two B-29s. And that was also the first air show that I've ever seen the Thunderbirds at. And on this air show, I got a chance to see Fifi fly with Doc for the first time ever. Well, probably the third time. It was the first air show that those two aircraft were together. And also got a chance to see the Blue Angels, and that's coming your way right now.
Um, are you chosen to be on the team, or do the pilots come to you and request to be part of the team? I can take that one. It's actually both. So there is an application process. Uh, everybody who's on the team is volunteered to come to the team and are part of what we call a, uh, an applicant class each year. And out of that uh, class will fill the open spot. So typically each pilot stays on the team for two years flying in the demonstration. Uh, as well as our uh, ground support officers like the maintenance officer, he's here for two years. Uh, Joe in the back there is our public affairs officer, he's on the team for two years. Uh, and so the, the competition can be very, uh, very intense for the, those positions. Uh, and, and then the team actually selects. So we, uh, we get a chance to get to know all the applicants through the first part of the season. Uh, we do a lot of research into their backgrounds. Uh, we, we pour over their applications and we spend a lot of time talking with them at show sites as we go around uh, the country in the spring and early summer. Uh, we'll neck that down to finalists and then the finalists will come down to Pensacola for uh, about three or four days uh, for an extensive interview process and then out of that we'll select who we want and we'll submit that up the chain of command to the Chief of Naval Air Training and ultimately to the Air Boss for the Chief of Naval Air Forces uh, for approval. And it's an analogous process for all of our enlisted team members and an analogous process for the, uh, the commanding officer and flight leader position. Of, uh, that position is selected um, by our boss at the Chief of Naval Air Training and a, a board of admirals and captains that, that basically does the same thing, which is at a higher level.
air speed and throttle setting are you at? Can you clarify, was that question about the slow speed pass? Yes. Okay, then I'll take it. Um, for that maneuver, we call it the section high alpha pass. The F-18 is capable of flying an extremely high alpha flight profile. We use a compromise alpha. We fly at 25 alpha, and that's designed to get us lower to the ground. There's, we build in each of our maneuvers a wave off capability. So we fly the aircraft at 25 alpha, which equates to approximately 118 knots, which is normally at sea level about 130 miles per hour. We do that generally from right to left. If we have a headwind, the, the slowest I've seen is about 95 to 96 knots. Good question. Boss, you want to take that one? Boss? Yeah, sure. Uh, for the uh, average number of flight hours, the minimum we're targeting is 1,250 uh, tactical jet hours. So that would include the uh, training time in the Navy trainer jets and then uh, fleet time, typically in F-18s. Uh, for the, uh, and, and often we have uh, pilots come to the team with a little bit more than that. Uh, for the number one position, it's a 3,000 hour tactical jet requirement. Up right there? How fast do your jets actually go? That's a great question. How fast 
Jessica, Jessica Wallet. We're not allowed to tell you that. <laughs> it's advertised as 1.8 Mach, so that's 180% the speed of sound, which is about 730 miles an hour. So if you multiply that times 1.8, that's what is advertised for our aircraft. We're not allowed to do that during the air show. The Federal Aviation Administration no, requires us. Call your congressman. <laughs> and for us at this show, the fastest airspeed you'll see are just over 700 miles an hour. The three way will smoothly shift back into a blue AT line. with a dynamic separation maneuver. pulls to level, each pilot will perform an individual brake turn and exit the flight line in a separate direction. The Blue Angel Barrel Roll.
I think I heard the question. I can take that as uh, when, when will we have a, another female Blue Angel? Is that correct? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we, we had uh, Captain Katie Higgins on the team flying Fat Albert the previous two seasons. Uh, and then uh, this year we don't have any uh, female pilots on the team uh, or officers on the team. And it really it just depends if you go back to that question on the applicants, um, when we get the applicants in. So um, I've, I think we've all flown and served with uh, just absolutely outstanding female pilots, uh, ground officers, um, Marines, Navy, uh, they're out there and they're doing an incredible job and I can tell you uh, there's zero difference uh, in a male versus a female pilot in terms of capabilities, zero. It's purely just based on who's interested in coming to the team and then once we get those applicants, uh, making sure it's a good fit. And that's the primary thing that we're looking for. Uh, we don't select based on gender at all. Uh, there are zero uh, gender discriminants that we would ever use. Uh, it's just based on uh, applicants. And so this year, uh, and like the previous year, we didn't have any female applicants. Uh, but I can end on this note that I, I promise you, it's not if, but when the first female Blue Angel is flying in the Delta, so number one through six. Uh, and I know we'll keep having uh, Blue Angels flying Fat Albert that are females. <laughs>
slowly being replaced by the F-35C. Will the Blue Angels be looking to transition to the Super Hornets or the F-35? Uh, no, that's a great question. We're going to transition to the Super Hornet, and that's going to happen fairly soon. A few more seasons, I think, in the, uh, the Hornet, but a lot of work is being done right now uh, to evaluate the Super Hornet. Uh, it's, it's been flown in the demo configuration by uh, the previous flight leader and uh, proved to be a, a great demonstration aircraft. So now it's just a matter of time of getting the airplanes converted. A lot of legwork is going into that right now. And so uh, the Air Boss, uh, the Admiral Shoemaker has come out and stated uh, 2019 as a goal to have a team in the Super Hornet. That's still being to be determined based on a variety of factors with the airplanes and the engineering work that will go into converting them. Um, but it could be as soon as 2019, it could be a little bit later, uh, but it's definitely coming. in front of the crowd, the Delta is making its approach to the flight line. Approaching center point, the entire formation will separate in dramatic fashion. Ladies and gentlemen, the Blue Angel Delta Breakout. Special thanks and a happy birthday to Sarah for making that happen. Thank you also to Frank for making that happen. Thank you, Mom, for making that happen back in 1979. Now, that is actually not all, but we're out of time for today. So next week, we're going to show you the salute to Apollo. North Star Oasis, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. For Dallas Pearson, our producer, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. <laughs>